Sital Vadva from the Alumni Relations Office. Welcome to each one of you for the webinar, Introduction to Game Theory. A warm welcome to our alumni who've uh, you know, logged in from across the globe and uh, across the programs. Uh, today's webinar, Introduction to Game Theory, is by Professor Prem Chandrani, who has around 40 years of uh, industry uh, experience uh, with um, as an industry leader, consultant, and an academician. Uh, he is uh, the professor in finance and a chairperson for international relations with us at SPJMR. Uh, today's webinar's moderator is uh, Ms. Ira Shukla. She's an alumnus, a part of PGDM program class of 2019 and currently working with Paul Gate. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sheetal. Thank you for the introduction. Uh... Uh, welcome to everyone out here today. Uh, I'm sure I would have known, I do know a lot of you and would have loved to have met you all. Uh, so the topic today is basically introduction to, to game theory. Uh, many of you obviously, I presume, have been to my game theory classes, whereas I have received uh, some you know, uh, messages, mails, uh, WhatsApp messages from alumni uh, suggesting that uh, they still remember uh, the game theory classes, you know, and uh, the first slide of the game theory class. So I'm, I'm going to reproduce that first slide again, uh, just so that, you know, we can go back and, and relive uh, the time that we had in class. Um, so um, let me share my screen. So nostalgia, I think, uh, Many of you would remember this, uh, the first slide, which is only the paranoid survive. And I, I, it, the idea came to me because I got messages from about seven or eight of the alumni who knew that uh, this was going to be done today. And they wrote to me that they remember the first slide. Okay, but <laughs> that's all I'm gonna talk about right now. Uh, but I'm gonna move on uh, and talk about game theory because I'm sure there are many alumni out there uh, who have uh, been at SPGMR before I arrived on the scene out there. And uh, so hello to all of you once again. So let's uh, you know, try to think about game theory and let me share with you the question about business strategy, all right? So uh, all of you uh, obviously are you know, involved in some form of work and strategy and, and all of you of course have also done some courses on strategy. So, let me ask you a question to see how much you remember. So uh, we want to increase market share of our product. Okay, what can they do? So someone is telling you, we want to increase the market share of a product. So what do you think they can do? Can I have some people putting on chat uh, what they think uh, people could do? Just a quick chat, you know, one or two or three, four people write down on chat. What do you think they can do? So this should be coming from everyone. Uh, we can differentiate in some way, reduce the price, introduce new product, reduce prices. Okay, all right, lovely. Understanding the competitors, customers, marketing, thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just stop the chat for a moment and, and this is what I, I heard from, so yeah, things like we should reduce prices, increase advertising spend, offer product promotions, buy two, get one free, and so on. But let me share this with you. Will this really help? Okay, it's a question. Will this really help? Let's, let's look at why I'm asking this question. Because we also need to consider how our competitors are likely to react. Okay, we, it's very common for us to think about what we want to do and very rarely do we think about what our competitors are going to do given what we are doing. So what happens? They reduce their prices even further. They spend more than you on advertising. They offer buy three, get two free, right? Now what happens in this whole process is that you might have done all the things you, you did, which you said you wanted to do so that you can, you know, uh, increase your market share, but effectively you might end up with having a lower market share than what you started off with. So we cannot think about situations only from our side, from one side. So that's the first starting point of game theory. So game theory is about thinking not only from what 
we think we want to do, but to think from the other side as well and say, okay, what do you think they wanted to do or what they will do given what we want to do, okay? So let's, let's see, uh, I'll take you to explaining what game theory is. So game theory is an art in many ways. The art of outdoing the adversary, knowing that the adversary is trying to do the same to you. Very critical. We need to think about what they are going to do and that they're also trying to beat us while we are trying to beat them. So it is not just me trying to beat them and their behavior is uh, static. It's about finding ways to cooperate, even when others are motivated by self-interest and not benevolence, okay? But they will still cooperate because there is joint self-interest which can be achieved uh, by working together. Game theory is the art of convincing others, and of course yourself as well, to do what you say, convincing others to do what you say, all right? The art of interpreting and revealing information, very critical. Okay, so others are doing something or they're, they're giving some messages, whether this is you know, verbal message or print message or the action message or whatever. How do you view that message? How do you interpret that message? And what are you doing and what information you want to flow to your competitors, for example? And how are they going to interpret that? And can you manipulate that in some form so that they may get a different message from compared to what you actually are doing? So these are all parts of, of game theory. Very importantly, the art of putting yourself in others' shoes so as to predict and influence what they will do, okay? So, um, important point to understand here is uh, when you're thinking about what they would do and you put yourself into their shoes, you have to think not in terms of what you would do in their shoes, but what they would do in their shoes. And there's a big difference out here. You know, we often tend to say, if I were in their shoes, this is what I would do. And this is how I want to think, therefore. But that's not good enough. In game theory, what we're saying is you have to think about what they would do in their own shoes. So that's, that's the difference out here. Game theory also is a science. It's a science of interactive decision making. So there are tools and techniques which, which are available you know, in science. The general principles, uh, you know, which are applied across different contexts. And of course, the context of the application is your own experience, which is the art. And the science is the different tools and techniques that are available for you to actually, you know, uh, succeed in the game. And therefore, if you're a good strategist, you would mix both science and art to play the game, right? So you've understood broadly what game theory is, but let's see if we can start applying game theory, okay? So let's start thinking how we can use game theory. So, you know, you go back to your days at SPJMR and, you know, you had lots of quizzes and MCQ tests. Here is one for you where you do not know the question, but you still need to find the right answer. So let's give this quiz to you. So I've given you five MCQ answers. You've got to choose the right answer. You think you can do it? Why don't you take a minute and see if you can find the right answer. So I'm gonna spend, you know, I'm gonna wait for, uh, don't worry about raising your hand right now. Uh, Kunal, I, I, I will give you an opportunity to, to give everybody an opportunity to express themselves. So um, just think about it and, and know what the right answer is. Don't put it on chat, just have it in your mind or a piece of paper in front of you, whichever you want. Uh, I'm gonna wait for another 30 seconds before I take you forward. So while you're thinking about this, I'm gonna give you a clue. Put yourself in the shoes of the examiner, okay? Remember we talked about it earlier, that what you need to do is to be able to think what others are thinking and what are they trying to do, okay? So if you're able to do that, perhaps you will be able to get closer to the answer. Okay, let's see, okay. So I'm gonna give you a small poll right now. Let's, let's see what happens in the poll. So here's your opportunity. I'm gonna launch the poll. All of you can see the same answer questions here. Which is the right answer? Can you please, you know?
Okay, another 10 seconds. All those who have not submitted their answers can do so now. All right, okay. So I'm, I'm going to end the poll now. Right. And uh, let me minimize this. And, and I, it was very interesting uh, what I saw in the poll. So let's try to think through this, this, this through and then see whether the poll has actually captured that or not. So what 16 square inches, that is C, be the right answer? Now, you might turn around and say, because 16 square inches is different from everything else, that should be the right answer. But start thinking from the perspective of the examiner, okay? Which kind of question would the examiner be able to give you which will confuse you between 16 square inches and the others. Okay, what is the purpose of the examination? The examination purpose is that the person who's giving the answer really understands the question and, and knows how to get the answer, All right? Now, effectively, if 16 square inches were the answer, then none of the other answers would be anyway, you know, obviously right because the others got a pie in between. So clearly 16 square inches is not the right answer, okay? So then we will start thinking, okay, what is this all about? So there's a pi. So pi means what? Pi means that this is something to do with the circle, right? Okay, so, and uh, since there's square inches, we're looking at an area. So we all know that the uh, formula for a circle area is pi r squared. So it's r squared, which means we're looking for a a perfect square. And there are only two perfect squares out here, which is four pi square and 16 pi square. So clearly eight and 32, which is B and E are not the right answers. Now it becomes more interesting. So far we applied logic. We've not applied game theory as yet, but now you're gonna start thinking about game theory in a while. Now let's say if it is 16 square inches, or 16 pi square inches, that's D. Okay, what is the question likely to be? The question could be, what is the area of a circle with a radius of four inches, All right? Now, obviously the answer is 16 square inches, but if you did not know the answer and you thought about the, uh, this, the area mistaken as the uh, circumference is two pi r, and in your mind two pi r is there, two pi r would give you eight pi square. If you also mistaken, you think it's two pi r squared, you may end up with 32 pi square inches. So clearly a person who's giving you the, the, the question wants to confuse you enough and therefore both eight pi square inches and 32 pi square inches are good wrong answers. Okay, now you started thinking about that. Now, what about four pi square inches? Suppose the question could have been what is the, uh, area of a circle with a radius two, and the answer is four pi square inches. But there's a slight problem there. And this is where game theory comes in. The slight problem is that if you were one of those people who made the mistake and gave the, in the previous situation thought about eight, which means you thought two pi r is the area, you still get four, square, four pi square inches, because two into two, two pi r is two, okay? R is two, pi is pi, and of course two. So, so that's the worst thing for an examiner, that someone who does not know the right answer still gets the right answer, you know? So this is what something, so if you could start thinking from the examiner's point of view, the answer clearly is 16 pi square inches. And if we look at the results of the poll, we will soon see how people have polled. So I'm gonna share the results. Okay, so there you are. But it's good that 39% have actually selected 16 pi square inches. Though of course the majority, 50, did 16 square inches. So, okay, you're beginning to understand game theory, just the beginning anyway. So uh, we will have more opportunities uh, for seeing and testing our skills regarding game theory. Okay, so let's, let's move on over there and uh, here um, and move on. I'm going to show you a small video. 
trying to explain to you what, what game theory is about. So, so bear with me for a second. I'm going to help you see a video right now. Please uh, listen to the, the dialogues as well because that would be meaningful. on the roof. Every guy gets a share. Five shares is plenty. Six shares. Don't forget the guy playing the job. He thinks he can sit it out and still take a slice. I know why they call him the Joker. So why do they call him the Joker? I heard he wears makeup. Makeup? Yeah, to scare people. You know, war paint. told you to kill me as soon as we loaded the cash. No, 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 no. I killed the bus driver. Bus driver? What bus driver? School's out. Time to go. It's not getting up, is it? That's a lot of money. What happened to the rest of the guys? just do the same to you. Oh, criminals in this town used to believe in things. Honor. Respect. Look at you. What do you believe in, huh? What do you believe in? I believe whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you stranger. So, um, 
we just saw a clipping from uh, the movie The Dark Knight, okay? Uh, and let's try to analyze the situation out here. There are several things over here which are really worth understanding and which are, you know, telling us about how DM theory actually operates, okay? So let's, let's try to understand that. So what's happening in the car? The driver says, three of a kind, let's do this. Passenger side, that's it, three guys? Or two guys in the roof, every guy gets a share. Five shares is a plenty. Six shares, don't forget the guy who planned the job. He thinks he can sit it out and still take a slice. I know why they call him the Joker. So what is the conversation going out here? It's about the sharing of the pie, which is the loot that they're going to get. And some people feel that the Joker should not be getting equal share uh, because you know, he's not taking the risk. I've discussed this many times with different people on experiments, and some people feel Joker should get a higher share because Joker is the mastermind. But Joker is taking an equal share. The important point to understand here is that when people promise you things, which looks way beyond being good, looks too good to be true, as we say, you've got to be careful because it's unlikely that things will work out as they have been planned. Okay, that's the first message to be taken away from here. And we saw that's what happened out here. The second thing is that we do not think that our behavior will be replicated by others. So Robert in the, in the, in the walls, the robber is asking, where's the alarm guy? Boss told when the guy was done, I should take him out. One less share, right? And he opens the vault. Funny, he told me something similar. So the guy who was opening the vault never thought that he would get shot. Though he shot the guy with the alarm, he never thought he's going to get shot. Why was that? Why did he think like this? This is a problem. Many a time we just believe that the, the behavior of others is static, that things would not happen to us, they only happen to others. And that's why when we're talking about game theory, it's, it's extremely important to understand what others are thinking about us, right? Because then we are better prepared. And the first sign out there, only the paranoid survive. The first slide talked about that. And that's important to understand. And we saw those two things happening in this over here as well. They never thought about it that way, right? The third thing which we need to kind of look up on and think is that there is something called self-interest, okay? And self-interest is something which drives the way we behave. Why do we do certain things, okay? And, and we do it because there is something for it, for us in it, basically. What is it that it is there for us? So, you know, we do things because, okay, you, you go to work because you get a salary, you know, you go out in the evening to watch a movie because it gives you enjoyment and so on and so forth. So you would only do, do those things where there is self-interest. If there is no self-interest, you would not do it. So self-interest is not the same thing as selfishness. And people often say, okay, what if the fact that there's so many people who are doing all these work, you know, like in COVID times so today, the doctors are, you know, working 24 seven. Other times also there are NGOs who are trying to help people out, there are individuals who go out and help others without anything for them. So where is their self-interest? The answer is that self-interest is there. And where is the self-interest then? Okay, the self-interest is in the fact that when I go out and help others and not take any money for it, my self-interest is in my happiness because I feel happy doing it. So when I, happiness is in my interest. So I, that's why I go and do it. But the self-interest is always existing. We need to understand one other thing around with that is that people will only do what they do because of self-interest. So corollary to that is that promises are never kept unless there's self-interest. So if you want someone else to keep a promise, please make sure that you also build in self-interest when they keep the promise. So they, that's, that's important to understand. Also, what we need to understand is that once you, like in this case, once a member performs his job, he loses negotiating power and the value to the team. Now this is not only in terms of robbers and stuff like that, it's true for everybody. I don't want to frighten anybody out here but even in organizations, why are people asked to go? Why are they given the pink slip? Because the organization does not see any further value 
of that person in the team. Now you may turn around and say, well, I have spent 20 years in this organization. I made this organization grow. I've done so much for this organization. Yeah, of course you did all that for the organization. They paid you for it. But if they don't see any value being given in the future, okay, okay, you have no negotiating power. Now, would there have been a negotiating power of these robbers? When all these robbers got killed, right? Yes. If the total haul of the money would be very small, you would need the same team to do another robbery. Then no one would get killed. The joker wouldn't tell kill the guy after the job is done because you would need the same alarm guy later to do another robbery, right? So in case of repeated situations or if there is a future value, then your self-interest remains and your value to the organization and the team also remains. So please start thinking you know, very, very carefully about what you are doing in your organization, which keeps you and makes you valuable. So, you know, you may go ahead and do great things for the organization. And you've done that at the cost of family, at the cost of your, you know, personal life and everything else. But if the organization is changing and they don't see value in what you can do for them in the future, what have we done in the past has no value at all, has no meaning. There's nothing called loyalty. Okay, this is a very important point to understand. And therefore, keeping yourself abreast with the changes that are happening, with what would be valuable for the organization in the future is a critical thing that you should be working with. So never assume your opponent's behavior is fixed. Predict their reaction to your behavior is something which we all saw happening out here. So game theory is the definition, formal definition, a study of rational behavior in situations in which your choices affect others and their choice will affect you. So it's rational behavior in interactive or interdependent situations, we saw that. What's rationality? Quick definition of rationality. When you think carefully before you act, when you're aware of what your objectives and preferences are, your own preferences, okay? You are aware of any constraints or limitations to your actions, and you choose your actions in a calculated way to do the best according to your own criteria. Your own criteria is important because for me, if I was doing you know, NGO work, the criteria is happiness. For somebody else doing some other work, the criteria is money. So whatever is your criteria, okay, you should be looking at that, then you said to be behaving rationally. So game theory works on rationality. Why is that important to understand? Because as we said earlier, we have to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes. And how do we put ourselves in somebody else's shoes without really understanding the rationality? Okay, so rationality is important because we believe that people are rational and they would behave rationally. The other element of game theory is common knowledge of rules. So the rules consist of a list of players, strategies available to each one of them, what is the payoff or the value they can get by doing different strategies. And of course, you know, as we said earlier, each player is a rational maximizer. So knowing the common knowledge of rules also helps you play game theory, but it allows you to understand what might happen. Okay. So if you are irrational, or if you do things which common knowledge is not available, you can gain advantage. And that's what happened in the, you know, 1967 Israel war with the Arab Arab nations. You know, there are six of those trying to attack Israel, and what Israel did out that time was when went, went flew into Egypt, okay, with their air force and bombarded all the aircraft that they had, and destroyed all the runways. So when the Arab armies attacked, they had no air support and the Israeli army was able to quickly go and, you know, finish off the Arab army. And that's how six days the war got over. So common knowledge and the ability to take people a surprise is an important way of playing game theory to win the game. Okay. Now I'm going to play another game with you right now. Let's look at this over here. So it's a small, big game. So let's say there are two players, player one and player two. And let's say the pot of money, in this case it's $10, okay? So the game begins like this. Player one proposes to share the dollar 10 with player two. And player one makes it the, the, the share. He says, okay, for example, player one can say, I will take five, I'll give five. Or I'll take nine and I'll give one, whatever. Player two has two options. Either player two can accept the proposal, which means whatever is nine, one, or whatever it is, 
or reject it. If player two accepts the proposal, that's the share, nine one. If player two rejects it, both get zero. Okay, is the game clear? Player one proposes, player two has the option to accept or reject. If he accepts, then whatever is the proposal division gets divided on that basis. If player two rejects, then of course both get a zero. Okay, so I want you to think for a moment, what if you are player one, how much would you propose to player two? Just think about it for the next five, seven, 10 seconds. This is a one-time game. You will not see player two again, okay? So there's no relationship between player one and player two. Okay, I'm sure you've all thought about it. So, uh, right, I should have done this earlier. Give me a moment, I'm gonna share the results of the previous poll. Uh, I think I did share that earlier, right? I did, yeah, okay, that's, that's, that's gone. Okay, let me close this, I'm gonna start another poll right now. And polling. Uh, so stop share. And I'm going to go to here. I'm going to launch a poll. Right. So if you're player one, how much you propose to player two? Less than a dollar? Between one and three, three to five, five to seven, or more than seven? All right, I'm going to close the poll in another five seconds. So please, those who have not polled as yet can, can, can give their votes. Okay, I am going to end this poll now. Interesting results, quite in line with what I thought. I will give you another poll now. Okay, if you are player two, what is the minimum you will accept? Okay, another five seconds. Okay. Here is an interesting twist. Okay, I'm gonna launch another poll. Let's assume, I've launched the poll already, that if you are player one, and player two did not have the right to reject. It means whatever you propose, player two does not have the right to reject. That's how it gets divided. How much would you propose to player two? Okay, I'm going to end the poll in, in another second or two. All right, so interesting, very interesting. Now, if we look at it rationally, 
player one should propose the minimum, which is one cent possibly to player two. Why is that? Because if player two is rational, player two knows that one cent is much better than nothing. And therefore player two would accept that one cent and say, thank you very much, at least I got a cent for nothing, okay? But I don't see that is the way we found our answers, okay? So I'm gonna share the results of the first poll out here. And you can see that 41% actually talked about three to five, some even more. So 60% were giving you know, median five or thereabouts, okay? And what was the reason for that? We'll come back to that. Let's, let's think through this carefully, all right? If you look at the second, okay, so you saw the first one here. If you look at the, if you're player two, we look at that poll. Okay, An even larger percentage now wants five or more. Interesting. So there is the rationality of player two. By right? saying, if you, unless you give me more than five, I will not accept it. Of course, three to five is the majority, but 29% or 35% is looking at more than five, which is a big number. Okay, so where's the rationality? Because you know, you get, you won't get nothing otherwise. You're saying also, either you give me five or more, then I accept nothing. Why is that out there? Okay, interesting. But the, the best one is yet to come, which is the next one. Right, 61% will only give a dollar if, player two does not have the right to reject. Okay, so let me, let me stop the poll over here for a moment and uh, get out of here. So I wanna go to the, to the next slide and then we can talk about this. The question here is, why do proposers give big shares to respondents, okay? Proposers may be unable to do correct backward reasoning, but that's not true. Because the moment when I said, okay, you, the player two cannot reject, everybody or many, majority of them went to say, we'll give one or less, okay? So that's not true. Proposers have other motives. They're not selfish, okay? They care about fairness. But if that was true, then in the last poll, that was poll number four, they wouldn't have all said one or less so you don't care about fairness either. So they fear responders will reject low offers so they'll get nothing. Ah, that could be the reason, right? So that's why in the dictator game, when proposers give away much smaller amounts on average, the point here is, the, again, this, this point about self-interest and rationality comes into play. So are we rational? Okay, yes, we are rational. So if we are rational, uh, why do we give more than you know, $5 or less $5 thereabouts? It extends our rationality. The rational rationality is this, if I'm player one, that player two might reject, okay? So that's why I just I get five, otherwise I get zero. So that's rational. So I'm extending the rationality, I'm not abandoning rationality. Is player two abandoning rationality? Because player two would also get zero if they, if they don't accept it. And it's an interesting point out here because player two thinks more about fairness and in their mind being fair is being rational. And that's why if you looked at the next, you know, poll number three is what's called that, there were more people saying five or more, okay? So now you can start seeing how people respond to different situations, okay? So when you are dealing with people, when you're doing wage negotiations, when you're dealing with suppliers, when you're trying to you know, trying to get, you know, uh, uh, other people to collaborate and cooperate with you. You have to start thinking like that, okay? What is rationality? Now, you know, of course, what you also got to understand that there are cultural differences. So there's a lot of variation, you know, in the way humans behave. So, you know, in Peru, the lower amounts are routinely offered and accepted. Okay, so if you give them a lower amount, $1, out of nine, out of 10, we played the game over there as well, it's accepted. 
But in few other cultures, more than half is offered, okay? Like culture of Japan, for example, okay? And in some societies, higher offers are refused. It's insulting. Why are you giving me more than five? Five is okay, but why more than five? Are you insulting me? You think I'm very poor? Okay, so cultural differences are important to understand. In other groups, rejections almost never occur. Like in, in Israel, you know, you can give them 10 cents and they'll accept it. Okay, so this game has been played across the world by many professors in many locations and some kind of collation has been done and they found that on average 44% is offered. That also gives you a feel about what's the global average in a way. Okay, so you're, you're beginning to understand uh, these, these differences actually. So that's why when I talked about game theory, I said you got to understand the context, which is the art, which is your experience. Where you know what cultural differences are there and of course use the science along with that. Okay, so again, important to understand if you're negotiating in Japan versus you're negotiating in Israel, how do you negotiate? What are the, what are the differences in your negotiation style, for example? Okay, so game theory comes into play there as well. So game theory, you know, is very useful. It helps us in, in, in many ways. It helps us understand events and outcomes, prediction of outcomes. And it, this is what consultants use. So, you know, consultants use game theory and advice because they know what the outcomes are likely to be. And then of course, what they do is they advise their clients on what different could be done to be able to change that outcome. And that is done often by using commitments, threats, promises, to help bring about that change. The other point which is very clear, we understand that we are not making decisions, we are always in games. We saw it in the first slide. We said we'll decide we want to reduce our price, we decide we will give a promotion. But we realize very soon that we are most often we are in games. So we've got to understand that we're not making decisions, we are actually playing a game most of the time. Sometimes you're playing the game because it started as a game, sometimes a decision can become a game. So what you started off with a decision could later on become a game. And if you don't foresee that game, you have a problem. So there's an example out here, choosing a contractor to build your home. So you choose the contractor that you want to give the, the job to, to build your house. But once you've given the job and once you've given the advance, it's no longer a decision it becomes a game because after the person has gotten advanced, he can now also hold you to ransom and not do the work as per schedule. So understanding that most of the time we are in a game and important to do that. So there are two kinds of strategic interactions. There's sequential games and there's simultaneous games. I mean, you need to know what kind of interaction we're actually having. So in sequential games, players are making alternating moves. You, know, you move, then I move and so on. But you're actually thinking about those moves. The moves may not be happening yet. For example, you're playing a game of chess. You think, okay, I'm gonna move this pawn, that guy's going to move the rook, and I'm going to move this and I'm going to move that. And so you think through two or three moves actually. You have not played the movers yet, sequential games. In simultaneous games, players act at the same time, but they're ignorant about the other's actions. So you have to start thinking about who are the other active players, what are they thinking, what are they likely to do, and which outcomes will finally emerge from there. Because I have to think about what, if I do this, what would they do that, you know, but simultaneously happening out okay so it's important to understand that there are two different kinds of games let's take a sequential game example out here okay so uh, situation here is charlie is visiting cuba on a holiday he meets a local businessman fredo who talks about the wonderful and what profitable opportunities that he can develop if he had enough capital so he offers charlie you invest a hundred thousand dollars with me and in a year i will turn it to five hundred thousand dollars which i will share with you equally so you will more than double your money in one year, okay? The opportunity described by Fredo is attractive and he's going to write a contract under Cuban law that I will give this to you. Question is, should Charlie invest? Okay, so think about it for 30 seconds or 10 seconds or whatever. What do you think Fredo is going to do, right? So think, if you're thinking about this issue, how do you actually represent this? So what game theory allows us to do is represent this in the form of a, a game tree. So this is what the game tree looks like. So Charlie has, Charlie is the first mover. He can either invest or not invest. And then Fredo is the second mover and Fredo can abscond 
or you can honor the contract. And what are the payoffs for each? If Fredo absconds, Charlie gets a minus 100,000 because his money is gone. Fredo makes 500,000. If he honors the contract, each gets, no, well, Fredo gets 250, Charlie gets only 150 because he gets his 100 back. So he only gets 150. So he gets 250 in cash, 100 in euros is cost, so he actually makes 150. If Charlie does not invest, it's zero for Charlie and zero for Fredo. Now, if you, if you look at this game tree out here, if you look at what Fredo would do, now Fredo's got a payoff of 500,000 here and 250,000 here. If this is a higher payoff, Fredo would choose to do this. If this is what Fredo is likely to do, then Charlie is going to choose between a minus 100,000 and a zero. And of course, he chooses the zero. Okay, so you can clearly see when you're using game theory and using a, it's a sequential game, you're using a game table out here to try to understand what is likely to happen, and then it helps you make a decision. Okay, so even though it looks like a very attractive opportunity, Charlie may not want to invest because he fears that under Cuban law, he would not be able to get into redress of because the contract is in the Cuban law. Okay, so Charlie does not have a strong reason to believe Fredo's promise. So Charlie should predict Fredo will abscond. But what, can there be reasons why Charlie could believe Fredo's promise? And that's why here again game theory comes into play. So contracts, they may or may not be enforceable and they take a long time to enforce, okay? But if you understand that this game is part of a larger game, say for example, Fredo requires for his normal business financing from the US, or Fredo exports goods to the US, or Fredo tells Charlie, I'm going to make this profit by producing in, uh, in uh, Cuba, and, but exporting it to the US, and you can give me the capital in, in, you know, in tranches, not the entire amount right now. So there are various ways in which the promise, okay, could become more credible. So game theory talks about how to get credibility for promises. Remember, we talked about the fact that people do not keep their promise. Promises are meant to be broken, okay? But the point here is that uh, if you can have some way that to increase the credibility of the promise, you should try to do so, okay? So the so key takeaways from the, the sequential game is look forward and reason backward. You have to predict what other player is likely to do. Your objectives, see, and their objectives may not be, uh, you know, the uh, may not be exactly the same. But if you are looking forward and, and moving backward, you can at least understand what is likely to happen. Okay. One quick point here: the last line here. If you have to take some risk, it's often better to do so quickly as possible rather than later. Okay. Uh, so if you are getting into a contract, you are playing a game, or whatever you're doing, take risks at the front end rather than the back end. This is another important uh, theory, game theory aspect out there. Uh, simultaneous games, you know what they are. Let's look at a situation out here. Uh, let's say there are two players, Reynolds and Philip Morris, okay? And they have a choice to advertise or not advertise. And the landscape is something like this. If each firm advertise, no, it doesn't advertise, each of them earn 50 million from their customers. This is profit. Advertising costs 20 million, but advertising takes 30 million from the competitor, profit. How do you represent this game? The simultaneous games are represented in the form of a game table. Okay, so there are two players out here, Reynolds and Philip Morris. Each have two strategies, not advertise, advertise, not advertise, advertise. And the payoffs are put on the table. If neither advertise, they have their profits of 50 each. If one advertise, let's say Reynolds does not advertise and Philip Morris advertises, then 30 of Reynolds profits will go to Philip Morris. So Philip Morris have 50 plus 30, 80 plus 20, but minus 20 cost of advertising, so they pay up of 60, vice versa here. And if both advertise, the 20 of the advertising cost gets reduced from both, and the payoffs are 30. So this is how you represent a game. Why do we represent a game in a game table? Because we now want to solve this game for an equilibrium. It's called, we're trying to find an equilibrium. And the way to look for an equilibrium is, is fairly simple. So what we tend to do is we tend to go through the different cells out here. It's called cell by cell inspection, okay, and to find out what's likely to happen. So let's say Philip Reynolds decided they want to advertise. 
Okay, so this is what Reynolds Society, this is the strategy Reynolds adopts. Philip Morris says, if you don't advertise, I get a payoff of 20. If I advertise, I get a payoff of 30. So since 30 is better than 20, I will advertise. If Philip Morris advertises, then Reynolds got a choice of not advertise or advertise. Reynolds is saying if Philip Morris is advertising, if we advertise, we get 30. If you don't advertise, we get 20. So what do we do? Both advertise. Okay, that's where they end up. That's where you have the, the Nash equilibrium. So we can find the Nash equilibrium in that fashion. Okay. But you will also find over here that both of them have a dominant strategy to advertise. What is a dominant strategy? That irrespective of what the other guy does, I'm gonna do this. So if you look at it over here, Reynolds would say, if Philip Morris does not advertise, I will advertise because 60 is better than 50. If Philip Morris advertises, I will advertise with 30 is better than 20. So Philip Reynolds will always advertise. Doesn't matter what Philip Morris does. And if you look at the other hand, Philip Morris says the same thing. Philip Morris is saying, if Reynolds advertises or doesn't advertise, I will advertise because 60 is better than 50. If Reynolds advertises, I'll advertise because 30 is better than 20. So they'll also advertise every time. So what you find is that the dominant strategy, both for Reynolds and Philip Morris is to advertise. And that's what they do. But you'll also see that when they're both advertising, their payoffs are 30 and 30, which is lower than what they would have got if they had not advertised. And this is why we call it a prisoner's dilemma. Okay, a term that you must have heard many a time. This is a prisoner's dilemma, and we don't want to get into a prisoner's dilemma, but we always get into a prisoner's dilemma because anything like a price war is a prisoner's dilemma. Many a time we get into a prisoner's dilemma because of the reasons that, you know, so the features of the prisoner's dilemma, there are two strategies, each plays a dominant strategy, and the dominant solution is worse than the better other solution. But if you have a dominant strategy, you use it. That's what we say in game theory. So I'm gonna give you a small, another last one, uh, you know, a small problem. I'm looking at the time as well. So each one of us producing the same product, okay? This is one single product. You can choose to produce one, or you can choose to produce two and you are deciding simultaneously and independently. If you produce one, you help to keep total supply low, the price is high. If you choose to produce two, you gain at the expense of others. Okay, we've seen this happening many a time, including OPEC, you know, we've seen that happening. So depending on the total number of people producing one, earnings would be as follows in this table. So number of persons who write one, who choose to produce one, suppose it's zero, then the payoff for the person writing two is 50, if say, three people write one, the payoff for the one writing two is 62, but for the people who are writing one is 12 and so on and so forth, right? So I want you to decide, you can see this thing, you understand, take a minute to understand what I'm saying. So again, I'm repeating myself. If you produce one, your payoff is four. If, if, if there's only one other person producing four, one, and the person's producing two will get 54 payoff. If 35 people produce one, or 30, 34 people produce one, but of the 35 people overall, each one producing one gets 136, but the only person producing two gets 186. So would you produce one or would you produce two, right? So let me quickly put the poll out here. And uh, here we are, I'm launching the poll. Quickly decide how many are you gonna produce. Right, okay, I'm going to end the poll in five seconds. So all those who have not voted, please vote. Government of India requests you to vote. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna stop the poll out here and I'm going to share the results and I'm not surprised at the results because you're all very rational. So majority of you, 72% offered to produce two. Okay, so you wanna produce two. Why? Because you get a higher payoff. This is exactly the problem which we have in prisoner's dilemma. So you are all caught in a prisoner's dilemma because you didn't see the prisoner's dilemma, all right? So if I wanna stop the share of the results over here, uh, what you would see is that 
If all 35 produce one, they would get 140 each. If everybody produced two, they would get 50 each. And yet, because of this greed of the 50 cents out here, everybody wanted to produce two, and they ended up getting 50, and they got 140. Okay, so you all actually fell in the prisoner's dilemma. So this is what really happens in real life, is that we are often in a prisoner's dilemma, and that is the thing to understand because we don't trust others or we are looking only at our own interests and don't, really, and don't care about what's happening to the industry, or what's happening to other players, okay? This, of course, is the interpretation. I'm not gonna spend too much time. I'll explain this to you anyway, right? So how to resolve a prisoner's dilemma? Very simple, you know, you reward cooperation and that's important, okay? So there should be some way on which you can actually reward cooperation. One of the ways, and most often, is getting a third party to be able to enforce whatever cooperation you have. Or you can punish the cheater on a short-term basis, tit for tat and so on. There was some you know, experiment done which said that if uh, one monkey were having the, the chain in the hand which pulls and the other monkey gets the food in a different cage, and if that monkey pulls the chain and this monkey gets the food, they would keep on helping each other. But if one monkey gives the food, the other monkey doesn't pull the chain to give the food to the, the previous monkey, they will stop, tit for tat happens, okay? So this is what it is. So, you know, in that game of the uh, uh, Reynolds and uh, Philip Morris, the government came in heavily and said, if you advertise, you're going to sue you for health costs. So they stopped advertising and you saw immediately the uh, payoffs went up to 50-50, okay? So prisoner's dilemma quite often is resolved by trying to get some third party who has, who has power to enforce the cooperation to do so. I'm gonna stop over here with the final slide out here, which says, uh, okay, there are lots of business situations where, you know, game theory can come into play, whether it's alliance, joint ventures, pricing, market entry, negotiations, so on and so forth. So if you know the simple principles of game theory, this is where you can get. I'm gonna stop out here and pass it on for questions. Um, so we have two questions, and I'll just read out the first one. Yeah. The first one is, how can travel and tourism industry use game theory against government decisions in this change? Sorry, against government? Against government decisions right. in this changing scenario. Right, very interesting. So, the travel and tourism industry wants people to come, right? Uh, and of course, they are suffering because of the COVID situation that we actually have on, on hand out here because the government is saying with quarantine, people cannot come. So if people cannot come, can the travel and tourism industry do something to go out? Okay, because the uh, point is that if we start thinking from the government's point of view, the government is not letting people come in. So can we go out and reach to people? Now, for example, restaurants are closed. Okay, hotels are closed. So what are they doing? What can they do? They can start saying, okay, fine dining experience in your houses. So, you know, you can't come to the hotel because, you know, the government is restricting us. Can we think about what you want, which is you want fine dining, you've been, you know, you're missing the food. So we are going to send fine dining to your home. So game theory is trying to think about, you know, your customer's mindset, for example, in this case, and see what you can do to be able to meet the customer's needs by doing something different. Right, next question, Ira? Yes, the next question is, isn't the solution to prisoner's dilemma the basis for cartelization? Uh, no, it's not cartelization. Okay, prisoner's dilemma basis is not really cartelization. The reason is very simple. Cooperation doesn't mean cartel. Suppose we all agree that we will not sell below MRP. Suppose we are, we are 50, Kirana stores in one city or one town. And we all agree we will not sell below MRP. Is it cartelization? No, it is not. Because cartelization is when you're fleecing the customer in some form by charging higher prices than usual. So it is basically cooperation. But how would you ensure that somebody, one of the four 50 Kirana stores does not reduce the price and sell below, below MRP? And that's why you need someone to be able to enforce what is there. So if they have, a, if they have a, a society or a federation of Kirana stores, say, and they say anybody who 
who breaks the, the, the discussion that we've had, the cooperation, will be, you know, not part of this anymore. And if they, if the, being part of the Federation has some value for this particular Kirana store, they would then follow what is happening. So the external party, the Federation therefore has power to, to ensure that uh, prisoner's dilemma is resolved. Thank you, sir. So I think there's also a couple of requests coming in in terms of what would be your recommendations for further readings in terms of what books can the uh, participants go and read. Sure. Let me try to see if I can put that in a, in a, in a chat uh, somewhere. Give me, let me open the chat. Okay. Uh, give me a second, if I may. I'll put something there. Okay, so I've, I've put something in the chat, which I suppose is, is usable. There are a number of books out there. Yep. Yep. Okay. We also have, we, all, we have a couple of good questions coming in, but um, one thing that's coming up is how to handle companies like Reliance Geo, which are not bothering about the prisoners' dilemma and payoffs because their intention was different. So, I mean, I think it's also related to the current geo move that has come in. Right. So, uh, see, geo, in a, the question here is that it's not good to be in a prisoner's dilemma. It's good to put others in a prisoner's dilemma. Okay. So, geo was trying to put Vodafone and Airtel in a prisoner's dilemma. Okay. What they did was when they reduced the price, they forced the others to also reduce their prices. But their income was from data, whereas the income for Vodafone and Airtel was primarily from voice. So when, when they did that, they put Vodafone and, and uh, Airtel in a prisoner's dilemma, and Geo themselves, of course, did not fall into that trap initially. So this is an important thing. So prisoner's dilemma is, can be used. You don't have to always be in a prisoner's dilemma yourself. You can often work to see how you can put others in the prisoner's dilemma. So if you understand game theory, you try to apply that to see how others get into prisoner's dilemma. Right. Um, so I think there's just this request in terms of the book names that you have shared. If you right. can reshare it, because I think in the all panelists and attendees section, you're not able to see it. I will do it again. Not a problem. Let me go back to the chat. Okay. So, uh, So I will give it once again, right? Yeah. To all panelists and attendees. Uh, right. So there we are. There are three books that I'm sharing with you, which you can you can spend more time looking at and. Uh, get greater understanding of, of game theory from uh, those books, actually. Right. We right. have so, Yeah, go ahead, Ira. Yeah, I mean, I know that we are really pressed for time, but there are multiple questions coming yeah. in, and we can probably take a last question. It also okay. seems very interesting. Um, so there is one, uh, this query, that how do we use game theory in price negotiations when we don't know how much the client will value your service? Right. So that's very interesting. That's why you have to put yourself in the shoes of the, of the client. As I said earlier, you have to start thinking about what the other person is likely to think, not about what you would do in their shoes, but what they are thinking and what is, when you're going to their shoes. So you have to read into the client's mind. So that comes from being able to apply the game theoretic principles that I talked about some of them and your experience, okay? And it's a combination of those two, the art and the science, the game theoretic principles and the art, basically putting it together, experience is the art, and then try to say, okay, what is it that the client is thinking, okay? You've got to understand the client's situation. Sometimes the client doesn't have an alternative, but of course the client puts up a front and says, you know, I'm not gonna pay so much. But you have to think, does the client have an alternative? 
have to you may have to think for example in terms about you know if the if the client doesn't if i don't give this to the client if i don't provide the service to the client what is the financial impact for the client and obviously i can then price my product accordingly and of course the third way is to see the balance like we saw in that stake split game you know how much should i offer to to be 5732 i want to take that to a level where i can balance between the fact that they will accept the offer and not reject it so i got to find that level so if it was a repeated game so if i am if i am in a situation where i'm repeating it i would know what what my other partner is going to accept in a one off game of course i'm a little handicap but still i want to still apply the same principles Makes sense. So thank you, Professor, so much for this wonderful session. I think I speak on behalf of all alumni when I'm saying it was so wonderful having this back to classroom feeling from you. And I think personally, two highlights that really stood out was you starting with that slide saying, you know, only the paranoid will survive, and I was like, yes, I am back in session. and also this really interesting thing of relating the dark night to promises and how people are really acting in their self interest i think it's going to stay with me for a long time so thank you so much uh, on behalf of all the alumni also i who i'm sure have had a wonderful session thank you for joining us and also thank you for the alum to the alumni team ratika ma'am sheetal ma'am jayshree ma'am for you know really taking out time for this and ensuring that we have such enriching sessions going on um to all the fellow alumni community i hope all of you are already signed in to the portal oh, and yeah. you are receiving your emails if not to make sure that you are receiving all the updates oh, it is we have interesting series going on and the next series uh, the next oh, session in the series that we have planned is by oh, professor oh, sheela and she will be talking on productize or servitize going ahead oh, So that's all that we have for this session today. Again, thank you so much, Tatka, ma'am. Over to you. Thank you, Tatka. You're welcome, Ira. Just one thing, I just want to mention that you know PGCM, uh, Alcom team has been really helping us and driving this with us. So uh, thanks to the PGCM team, and Ira, thank you so much for joining in. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am.